I'd like you to take the Word of God now, if you would, and open to the 21st chapter of Job. Brother Joshua Schwarzler is going to come and bring the message. And first we'll read the text. We're coming to the end of the second round. When we started the second round, it was second time, same as the first. Second verse, same as the first, a little bit louder, a little bit worse. Well, we're finishing the second round today, and then next week we're going to get into third time and see if the third time's a charm with Eliphaz and then Bildad, and we'll find Zophar just gives up. And uh, I hope that you've been helped and encouraged by these messages but there's also plenty to look at here that can be disheartening and discouraging. So we pray for a right perspective as we read. Are you there? Job 21? All right, let's read together. I'll read aloud. You read silently, beginning in Job 21, verse 1. But Job answered and said, Hear diligently my speech, and let this be your consolations. Suffer me that I may speak, and after that I have spoken, mock on. As for me, is my complaint to man? <clears throat> and if it were so, why should not my spirit be troubled? Mark me and be astonished and lay your hand upon your mouth. Even when I remember, I'm afraid and trembling taketh hold on my flesh. Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power. Their seed is established in their sight with them and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. <coughs> Excuse me. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not. Their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. They send forth their little ones like a flock and their children dance. They take the timbrel and harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. Therefore they say unto God... Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him, and what profit should we have if we pray unto him? Lo, their good is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. How oft is the candle of the wicked put out, and how oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributeth sorrows in his anger. They are as the stubble before the wind. And as chaff that the storm carrieth away, God layeth up his iniquity for his children. He rewardeth him, and he shall know it. His eyes shall see his destruction, and he shall drink of the wrath of the Almighty. For what pleasure hath he in his house after him, when the number of his months is cut off in the midst? Shall any teach God knowledge, seeing he judgeth those that are high? One dieth in his full strength, being wholly at ease and quiet. His breasts are full of milk, and his bones are moistened with marrow. And another dieth in the bitterness of his soul, and never eateth with pleasure. They shall lie down alike in the dust, and the worms shall cover them. Behold, I know your thoughts, and the devices which ye wrongfully imagine against me. For ye say, <coughs> Excuse me. Where is the house of the prince? And where are the dwelling places of the wicked? Have ye not asked them that go by the way? And do ye not know their tokens, that the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction? They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. Who shall declare his way to his face, and who shall repay him what he hath done? Yet shall he be brought to the grave, and shall remain in the tomb. The clods of the valley shall be sweet unto him. And every man shall draw after him, as there are innumerable before him. How then comfort ye me in vain, seeing in your answers there remaineth falsehood. This is the word of the Lord, and I encourage you to have something to write with and something to write on. Brother Josh, if you would come now and bring the word of God for us. Okay, so the title of this message is Mock On, Your Day is Coming. And you might say... Where do you get that from? Well, that I get from the text. Job specifically says, mock on. But the theme of the passage of Scripture is, mock on, your day is coming. 
So Job, in verses 1 through 7, uh, there's many different views as to what is going on here, but I see Job losing his cool with his friends, meaning he's kind of at his end, and he's just like uh, fed up or done with their foolishness. So in verses 1 through 7, Job is either being sarcastic or passive-aggressive. And either of those uh, are possible. So Job, he says, Suffer me that I may speak, and after that I have spoken, mock on. So in verse 3, Job says that they find listening to him arduous and a huge task. He says, suffer me that I might speak. Like, they were suffering to listen to him speak. And Job's like, that's ridiculous. And how he's saying that. And you kind of get the feeling he's saying that either sarcastically or passive-aggressively. But before we get there in verse 2, you see Job saying, hear diligently my speech and let this be your consolation. So, why does Job say that? Because he is setting up the passage of Scripture. He is setting up what the intended meaning is. And so, Job, in verse 2, essentially says to his friends, Listen, learn, and weep. And that's because Job intends to draw a parallel between the wicked men, and his friends. And you see that in uh, the passage of Scripture. So, in verse 3, Job says uh, that they find it difficult to listen to him. It's arduous, a big task. And then he tells them, mock on after I've spoken. So Job tells them to mock on after he is finished. So what does that mean? Job is seeing what they have done before in their conversation as mocking him. This means that Job feels as if his friends have been mocking him and trying to hurt him mentally and spiritually and emotionally. And how Job words it here, he's actually mocking them for mocking him, but he still wants them to know the truth and to repent, to realize that there is an issue there that they need to repent of. Now, whether or not they were truly mocking Job, that they were uh, truly being malicious, we do not know for sure, but it kind of seems like that. But it could be that it's just Job, uh, the trial he's going through, causing him to see that where it's not there. And uh, Job, in this trial, it's a great trial, and he is finding it difficult to remain Christ-honoring in uh, the trial, in, in his conversation. And if you are going through a great trial, it will be difficult for you to remain Christ honoring in your conversation if you are not fully focused on God for help. God can help to make it uh, easier to go through the trial possibly or at least easier to stay Christ-like in a trial, uh, Christ honoring in the trial. So like Job, you might want to say in a trial that God has done this to me. But that's not the right outlook. And that outlook causes a disconnect in thinking about our relationship with God and allowing for our sin nature to win out in sometimes. And in Romans 7, uh, 18 through 20, the Bible says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. 
For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil that, which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So the disconnect that not looking to God causes, it's something in our thinking. Because God, during a trial, or at any point, never stops loving you. And if you are unsaved here today, God won't stop desiring to see you saved. Because the Lord says that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God loves you. God cares about you and cares for you. And during a trial, he can give you peace, hope, and comfort. And it is something that the world, those that aren't saved, they don't have it in the same amount as Christians because we have the Holy Spirit living within us and the Holy Spirit helps us in a trial. So Job, he is saying that his friends are mocking him and it's just going downhill with uh, his friends. And in Job uh, chapter number uh, 21 in verse 4, the Bible says, As for me is my complaint to man. And if it were so, why should not my spirit be troubled? So in verse 4, Job is questioning the justice, justice of God and justifying his anguish of spirit. So, there are uh, two different views as to looking at this, but we'll go with uh, just looking at it through what the Bible says. But uh, Job is defending his anguish of spirit because his friends have said it is not justified, but Job justifies it as natural. So, in verse number four, it says, As for me is my complaint to man. So, what is that saying? My complaint to man. And that is a question, because uh, the Geneva Bible translates it different than uh, the King James. Therefore, you have older scholars saying different things than more modern uh, scholars that would have used the King James. So, according to the Geneva Bible commentary, Job could be saying, I do not talk with man, but with God, who will not answer me, and therefore my mind must be troubled. And from that uh, point of view, Job is questioning the justice and goodness of God and justifies his anguish. Now, Job also could be justifying it as he is having a fight with God and not man, and therefore, who would not be justified in having anguish of spirit? Because in a battle between you and God, you're going to lose every single time. Because God is so great, so powerful, that uh, we are absolutely nothing in comparison to him. Because God is so great and so good. So, in terms of a battle, you don't stand a chance. So, Job uh, could be justifying it, uh, saying, I'm battling with God, I don't stand a chance, that's why my spirit's anguished. And it could be either of those, but in the last couple verses of the first point, in, starting in verses 5 and going through verse 7, the Bible says, Mark me and be astonished, and lay uh, your hand upon your mouth, even when I remember I am afraid, and trembling taketh hold on my flesh. Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power. And so...
I have way more pages and notes than I normally have. So, okay. So, Job, in verse number five, he is concluding his opening with telling his friends to listen and that they will be astonished in what they hear. So he says, Mark me and be astonished and lay your hands, uh, your hand upon your mouth. So I'm not sure if this is still a thing, but back when I was a kid, if you were really astonished, you'd go like, wow, or something like that as a thing of astonishment. And from what I'm understanding, that is what this is talking about here. And... In verse 6, Job is saying, Even when I remember, I am afraid, and trembling taketh hold on my flesh. And so Job is likely trying to get them to be astonished at their own wickedness and repent. But Job could have intended it to be vindictive and saying that they will be astonished at what Job is accusing them of. Now, starting in verse 7, you have the wicked prosper. The Bible says, Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? Their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. And there's a whole bunch of things in verses 7 through 15 of the wicked prospering. So first off, we see that the wicked have many good children. Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power. Their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. So that means that they have many good children. And then we see their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. So the wicked have houses that are safe from the world and the rod of God's wrath. Now Job his house was taken down. His houses of his kids were taken down, uh, and or at least in one case. And his family was pretty much destroyed by the rod of what he perceived as God's wrath. Whereas it was just Job uh, being tried. God was allowing Job to be tried. It wasn't truly the rod of God's wrath that Job was feeling. Now, in verse number 9, or 10, it says, Their bull gendereth, and faileth not. Their cow calveth, and casteth not her calves. So, the simplest and uh, best way to put this is that the wicked have bovine that are fruitful and multiplying. And where it says, uh, casteth not their calves, uh, there's two different views as to that. But from what uh, I understand, ca that means that the calves are not dying stillborn, nor are there any runts, or, or, or nor, whichever. Uh, it could be for either view, but or both, but uh, then we have, in verse 11, they send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. So, the wicked have a multitude of children that are happy. And Job, he's lamenting the fact that he lost all of his children. And Job is saying here, the wicked are prospering. But God has brought me down. And that isn't good. That is not a good way to think. Because God has allowed this trial. And Job, his focus is not on the goodness of God. But rather it is on himself. And you see pride there. And you see Job as judging God as not being just, saying that the wicked, they're getting all this good stuff, but the Lord took it from me, all the stuff that I had that was good. And then we have 
uh, in verse 12, they take the timbrel and harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. So the wicked, they care only about their happiness and live their lives in wealth and happiness until they die. And the wicked, because of their wealth and power, have no need to go to God, and they have no need in their minds to do what God says. And you see that in verse 14. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. So the wicked have become right in their own eyes, and they find their knowledge to be equal or greater than that of God's. And that is not good. Because the wicked, when they think that they are greater than God, that's a major issue. But the unsaved person, that's the way they think. They don't think of God as being good and uh, worthy of glory, honor, and praise. They don't think that way because they are under sin. They are under their father, which is the devil. And so the wicked, what needs to happen for them to get right is to seek Jesus and be saved. Now, we'll actually talk more about that in the judgment of the Almighty. And that's verses 16 through 34. And Job says here that there is judgment coming. And in verse 16, it says, Lo, their good is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. So, Job He's saying their good is not in their own hand. They don't know what is good. They think they are in control of everything good that they have, but they're not. It's under God's control. Now, they do not control their own good because they have alienated themselves from God, yet he remains willing and able to save them. And Job then says... In the latter part of verse 16, the counsel of the wicked is far from me. Now, there are three ways to look at what this is saying. First, that Job is not talking about his friends being as the wicked, and therefore the counsel of the wicked is far from him. Uh, That's one view, but it doesn't fit well with the beginning and the ending of this passage of Scripture, because... In verse 3, Job says to his friends to mock on. And at the end of the passage of Scripture, uh, Job has another such uh, statement wherein he says, "How How then comfort ye me in vain, seeing in your answers there remaineth falsehood. So it could be that Job is not referring to them as wicked, but I don't think that is the best way of looking at it. Uh, Now, the next view is that Job is speaking sarcastically as if to say, the counsel of the wicked, it's right here with me. It's you all. And it could be Job saying it like that. Or, and I think this is the best way to understand what Job is saying here, Job is saying that he will not listen to the counsel of the wicked. And Job, he knows enough to trust in God, to look to God, but yet he isn't fully looking to God as he ought to. And that is why Job is really struggling here. And it's why we really struggle in trials and tribulations, because we don't always look to God in everything as we ought to. Now, in verse 17, 
the Bible says, How oft is the candle of the wicked put out? How oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributeth sorrow in his anger. So Job in verse 17 says that the wicked will have a reckoning from God, and they will have sorrow, and they will die. And then in verse 18, the Bible says, They are as stubble before the wind, and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. So in verse 18, Job is saying, The wicked, they will become as nothing. So Job, he's in the middle of this. He's saying, this isn't right, what God is doing, that the wicked are prospering. But Job says he, that he realizes that they will have a judgment. He, it kind of seems, though, like he's wishing that they would be judged like how he is being judged. Or rather, the trial that Job is going through, he views as judgment from God, and it's not really. It's just God allowing him to go through a trial. But Job is kind of saying, hey, I wish they were going through this sort of trial instead of me. Now, in verses uh, 19 through 25, the Bible says, God layeth up his iniquity for his children. He rewardeth him, and he shall know it. Now, there are two ways of translating or interpreting this. And oh, I, you'll, the book of Job, there are a lot of things that you'll have good translations say totally different things. Like uh, the King James Bible is the best uh, Bible translation for the English-speaking people. But the Geneva Bible at its time was a great translation. And it's what the pilgrims used. And it was used by God, just as the King James Version has been used by God. And it translated stuff completely different. And you might ask, why? And I've talked about this some. Hebrew is difficult to translate sometimes. And here in the book of Job, definitely it is difficult to translate. So, God layeth up his iniquity for his children. The two ways of interpreting it is that Job feels that God saves his wrath and then pours it out on his followers, that being God's children, the followers of God, and God brings them to nothing and or kills them. And I disagree with that view because God, he allows us to go through trials, but we are spared from uh, God's wrath because we are saved. Now Job, he followed God, and he looked to God for salvation. And so, if Job felt that way, it wasn't right, because God is good. And the second uh, way of looking at it is that God is saving his wrath, and then pours it out in judgment on the wicked and brings them to nothing or and or kills them. And that, I believe, is the uh, most biblical way of uh, translating it. But in either way, in uh, verse number uh, 25, and another dieth in the bitterness of his soul and eateth nothing pleasure. In verse 26, sorry. They shall lie down alike in the dust, and the worms shall cover them. So no matter which view you hold to, the people become dust. So when you die, eventually you will turn to dust. The wicked person, they will turn to dust. The Christian will turn to dust. In that, we are alike. But... The Christian, we know that one day we will be with God in heaven, physically. And we know that God is good. And we have the help and comfort in the trials. So, 
in verses 27 through 34, we see Job's conclusion. And Job's conclusion is that Job, he flips the table on his friends and tells them that while they thought him to be wicked, he was not. And in doing so, he infers that they are actually wicked like how they thought him to be. So in verse 27, he says, Behold, I know your thoughts and the devices which ye wrongfully imagine against me. For ye say, What is the house of the prince? And where are the dwelling places of the wicked? Have ye not asked them that go that by that way? And do ye not know their tokens? That the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction, that they shall be uh, brought forth to the day of wrath. We shall declare his way to his face, and who shall repay what he hath done? Yet shall he be brought to the grave, and re shall remain in the tomb. The clods of the valley shall be sweet unto him, and every man shall draw after him, as they are innumerable before him. How then comfort ye me in seeing your in your answer there remaineth falsehood. So Job is saying, you've been judging me as being wicked. But... In what you have said, there is falsehood. And Job is saying, you better look at yourself because there's wickedness there. And the Bible, it tells us to uh, remove the moat out of our eye before we remove the speck out of another person's eye. And essentially, that's what Job is saying right here. And... Job, throughout this passage of Scripture, has let it be well known that there is a coming judgment for the wicked. Now, given how Job implies that his friends are wicked and that God will judge them for it, uh, we see that Job, he cares for them. He doesn't want them to suffer as the wicked will suffer. And whether Job's friends were truly wicked or misguided, it is hard to tell. But Job is right that there is a judgment for the wicked and all those who do not follow Christ. And Job was right in the fact he desired to see them turn from wickedness to righteousness. While the wicked might seem to avoid the wrath of God on this earth, all those who refuse to accept Jesus Christ as Savior will suffer God's wrath throughout eternity in hell. So, if you die right now and you are not saved, you would go to the fires and torments of hell. And you do not want that. Because you will suffer for all of eternity. And the wicked, in this passage of scripture, it seemed like they had all this great stuff and never received judgment. But there is an eternal judgment, and that judgment is hell. Now, we as Christians, we have uh, salvation through Jesus Christ. And that same salvation is open, available to the wicked. Just call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And we as Christians, we won't have to endure the fires and the torments of hell because we are saved by Jesus Christ. And that is a great thing. And when we die, we will go to heaven. And as Job pleaded for his friends to turn from the wickedness, uh, their wickedness to God, so I plead with you. If anyone here or on the live stream is not saved, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation today and be saved. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, and I pray that you would work in what was said for your honor and for your glory, and help us to go from here in safety. 
And I pray that you would work in Emmanuel Baptist Church and use us for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.